Tonight, Hockey Canada's leadership is out. After months of scandal and revolt, the CEO and board of directors stepping down. Today was an important first step. What it means for the future of hockey in Canada. More missiles smashed down on Ukrainian cities. How would you describe just the way the Russian... Our team on the ground witnesses signs of a Russian retreat. And from Broadway to Hollywood, to one of TV's favorite amateur detectives. Well, one of you adolescents, please tell me what's happened. Angela Lansbury, a legendary career with a Canadian start. This is The National, with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for joining us. A major shakeup tonight at Hockey Canada after months of mounting pressure and widespread criticism over the handling of sexual assault allegations involving players. The organization's top leadership is out. The changes include the president and CEO, Scott Smith, who's leaving after three decades with the organization. Hockey Canada also says its entire board of directors is stepping aside. Well, this was the kind of leadership change many were calling for. There are questions tonight about whether it's enough. Ashley Burke starts our coverage. It may be the boardroom equivalent of pulling the goalie. Hockey Canada's CEO resigning as a last-ditch effort to save the organization's reputation. There's work to do to transform the culture at Hockey Canada, but today was an important first step. After months of mounting pressure, President and CEO Scott Smith stepped down. So will the entire board of directors. Hockey Canada says it recognizes the urgent need for new leadership. Everybody that resigned was all, all committed to change. But uh, I think it was just a lot of pressure. A parliamentary committee has been investigating Hockey Canada's handling of group sexual assault allegations and a fund made up in part of players' registration fees to settle cases. Will the lights stay on on the rink? I don't know. But the organization took its hardest hit after the board's interim chair defended leadership and described Hockey Canada as the victim. Or to scapegoat hockey as a centerpiece for toxic culture is, in my opinion, counterproductive. Andrea Skinner resigned on Saturday after every major sponsor pulled support of the men's program. They have lost millions of dollars through sponsorship. Sponsorship that took decades to come. Its marquee tournament may be lost too. Co-hosts of this year's World Juniors, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, say they want more reassurances the culture will change. We're partners in this, in this tournament. So, so we, we'll learn more from Hockey Canada and, and decide from there if it's enough. A concern shared by the federal sports minister who also wants meaningful action. To implement culture change and fight uh, sexual violence in the organization. But some in the hockey world don't see the resignations as the solution. I don't think it specifically fixes the problem. I think that, uh, you know, it might, it might uh, pro provide some outside uh, and new, a new perspective from people coming in from the board. It depends on who puts their names forward. Okay, so Ashley, walk us through what we know about when this new leadership team will be in place. Well, Adrian, Hockey Canada was already going to have an election for its board of directors this fall. That's now been moved to mid-December, and every member of the board has promised that they won't run for re-election. So that means that all nine positions will be open. And we've heard that during the last election, more than 200 names were put forward. So it'll be interesting to see how many raise their hands this time in light of all of this public controversy. No kidding. Ashley Burke in Ottawa, thank you. Now, from the upper ranks of Hockey Canada to locker rooms across the country, there are growing calls for an all-out effort to help change the culture of the sport. As Susanna De Silva reports, there are some challenges ahead. Along with hard shots, fast skating, accurate passes, some coaches say there are other skills that must be taught now more than ever. You have to start looking at yourself and... and you know, other coaches and, and people involved in the game and be like, are we doing the right thing here? Owen Hart played junior hockey. He now coaches two girls teams and helps run a hockey school. He says it's time to focus more on lessons off the ice. Uh, having group discussions and being open and uh, vulnerable to talk about, you know, what's okay, what's not okay. And, and uh, yeah, just 
making sure everyone, parents, kids, coaches, managers, all know what's acceptable and what won't be tolerated. A change of culture critical at a grassroots level and all the way to the top of Hockey Canada. We need people in the room that understand the experiences of these people, whether it's queer people, whether it's sexual assault survivors, whether it's people of colour and BIPOC people, Indigenous people. We need people in the room that understand these things. Bring Team Canada home. Watching closely will also be sponsors. Tim Horton says it won't reinstate support until more progress is made, while Bauer has paused its support. We're working behind the scenes, meeting with Hockey Canada executives to try and align on the changes needed. But there's some worry the damage to Canada's game has been done. There's going to be families and parents that, you know, they were maybe looking at hockey as an option before. Maybe they'll see and be like, I don't think I want my kid involved in something like that. An unfortunate consequence for those who he says are already working to change the sport. Susanna Da Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Now to Russia's war on Ukraine, where it is another night of desperation and destruction. After Russian missile and drone strikes again pounded cities and towns, a reality our crew on the ground has witnessed. Now, according to Ukrainian officials, about 100 strikes in recent days have plunged more than 300 cities and towns into darkness and driven civilians underground again. It is what the UN and G7 countries suggest could constitute Russian war crimes. But on the battlefield, Russia is still reeling from defeats and retreats. Ukraine has momentum in the war, and Briar Stewart has seen the signs firsthand. Once again, the city of Zaporizhia pummeled by Russia's firepower. A dozen missiles struck the city Tuesday, killing at least seven. This after an even more intense barrage Monday. Many rushed to shelter underground or seek safer cities altogether. Tatiana Shahovska is sending her daughters to western Ukraine because Zaporizhia has become too dangerous. It's very bad. I want to burst out crying, but we need to do this. At this time, it's safer there. <laughs> On the same platform, another tearful goodbye. A soldier going back to the front line. Over the past two days, Russia has fired more than 100 cruise missiles into Ukraine, targeting civilian infrastructure like water and electricity after an attack over the weekend on the bridge to Crimea and weeks of Russian failures on the battlefield. In northern Kherson, Ukraine has taken back several hundred square kilometers since the beginning of October. <laughs> Some Ukrainian soldiers who fought to liberate villages can now take a short break, enjoy some borscht and clean out weapons. But the fighting hasn't stopped. And so how would you describe just the way the Russians Ah, oh, don't back? care. It's good. It's not for our souls. <gasps> he means that's Ukraine firing south towards the Russian soldiers who withdrew so rapidly that he was even surprised. I can't uh, understand why are they uh, retreating so uh, fast and uh, unorganized. Russian trenches lie abandoned, so do tanks. Fields are littered with casings from cluster bombs. The reprieve means that some villagers have returned. See, we're down here. Viktor Kopitschok says Russian soldiers accused him of conspiring with the Ukrainian military. They locked him in here every night for three weeks. He says he was interrogated and burned with a hot poker. I can't describe what I've been through. Maybe there were normal people amongst them, but there are also those sadists, simply sadists. The soldiers may be gone from here, but Russia hasn't given up on her son. It has proclaimed this area as its own and has vowed to keep fighting for it. Briar Stewart, CBC News, in North Kherson. With its cities facing renewed attacks and a long winter of difficult fighting ahead, Ukraine is calling for more support from allies. And as Katie Simpson shows us, so far, it's getting it. At this pivotal moment, Ukraine's president urgently repeated his ask of G7 allies, including the U.S. and Canada, for more weapons. When Ukraine receives a sufficient quantity of modern and effective air defense systems, rocket strikes, the key element of Russia's terror, will cease to work, he said.
The emergency meeting ended with a broad, renewed pledge of support, while the U.S. says it's trying to expedite a new shipment of sophisticated systems. We are absolutely committed to continue to provide air defense capabilities to Ukraine in concert with their needs. Momentum is on Ukraine's side, and with each victory on the battlefield comes renewed fear. Russian President Vladimir Putin will become even more erratic. The Russian army has been rendered almost combat ineffective. Putin will reach a point where he either has to escalate using weapons of, of mass destruction or to withdraw. And that is the point at which, at which we are rapidly approaching. NATO says it's taking Putin's nuclear threats seriously, though so far there's nothing to indicate he's prepared to act. We have not seen any changes in Russia's posture. But we remain vigilant. Russia's foreign minister criticized all the speculation, telling the state broadcaster nuclear weapons would only be used as a defense tactic. Also suggesting Putin may be ready to meet with the U.S. president. But at this point, expectations are low. A diplomatic resolution can be found. Ukraine wants all of their territory back, including Crimea, understandably. And for Russia, this is now very much... Vladimir Putin's war, who is looking at a, a major loss. I sadly do not see a diplomatic solution at this point. It's going to have to be a total capitulation by one or the other. And Katie, you know, to that point, it surely looks like the tentative signs that Russia might be ready to talk are, are getting a very cool reception. The U.S. State Department said if Russia is ready to have some diplomatic conversations, a good start would be to stop the brutal assaults in Ukraine. Diplomacy will be front and center this week. The UN General Assembly is likely to vote on a draft resolution condemning Russia's illegal annexation attempts, and NATO defense ministers are meeting in Brussels. Canada's defense minister will be there, and ahead of that gathering, she announced that Ottawa will deploy another 40 combat engineers to help train Ukrainian soldiers. Adrian. All right, Katie Simpson in Washington. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. So how real is the risk that Vladimir Putin goes nuclear? We will put that question to a former advisor to U.S. President Joe Biden a little later in the show. There's an agreement tonight between Israel and Lebanon that ends a decades-long dispute over their maritime border. It was brokered over the course of months by the U.S. It's going to benefit the region uh, and ultimately uh, benefit the entire world. Hailed as a historic breakthrough, this deal divides the disputed 860 square kilometers of Mediterranean Sea between the two countries, allowing Lebanon to develop natural gas fields there while paying Israel royalties. And from London tonight, Buckingham Palace says the date is now set. King Charles III will be crowned on May the 6th. The coronation will be held at Westminster Abbey, as it has for hundreds of years. Royal watchers expect Charles' service to be shorter than his mother's, with a smaller guest list, keeping with his plan for a slimmed-down monarchy. May 6 also happens to be the fourth birthday of his grandson, Archie, the son of Prince Harry. After a ceremony back here in Canada, Danielle Smith is now officially the Premier of Alberta. And as Julia Wong shows us, Smith already appears to be tempering a key promise that got her there. Hi, Marlena Danielle Smith. Moments after being sworn in, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith called for Canadians to come together. Partner with Alberta. We can work together to build the strong, prosperous and unified Canada we know we can be. Unity, but with limits. Smith is still playing to feelings of Western alienation that helped her take control of the United Conservative Party. Her signature proposal, a sovereignty act, to let Alberta reject federal laws and court rulings it says are not in its best interests. But Smith now says she will follow Supreme Court of Canada decisions. We will abide by the decision of the Supreme Court, but you bet, we're up, up until that point, we are vigorously going to defend every area of our, our constitutional you. jurisdiction. This constitutional law expert says the proposed Sovereignty Act is inherently flawed. I think the fundamental premise of the act remains unconstitutional in, in that a province has the jurisdiction to say, we don't like that federal law. Our country doesn't work like that. 
But there's a similar sentiment from Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe, who's also pushing back on what he calls federal intrusion. All of the moves that we are taking from here up to and including reaffirming our constitutional rights as a province um, are about Saskatchewan and they're about the opportunity that we have in this province to grow and prosper. Saskatchewan and Alberta are usually aligned, one political scientist says, and Moe has an ally in Smith. The timing I don't think is a coincidence. I think he's looking to build on some of that momentum. So there are definitely a, as a segment of the population that feels very strongly is animated by Western alienation. Smith wants to make the Sovereignty Act her first piece of legislation, so she needs to get her caucus on board. Her first session as Premier begins at the end of the month. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. There is confirmation tonight that the Prime Minister will be called to testify in an inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act during convoy protests earlier this year. Justin Trudeau is among 64 names on a newly released list of anticipated witnesses. It includes seven of his cabinet ministers, but not Ontario Premier Doug Ford. Also on the list, six organizers of the protests that clogged Ottawa streets for three weeks, some of whom face criminal charges. The public hearings will begin on Thursday. A new law in effect in Ontario tonight is the first of its kind in Canada. It means some people are about to find out if their bosses have been tracking them while they work at the office or at home. Nisha Patel takes us through the new rules. Anytime you're using a work device, your boss could be watching. It's technically like being spied on, you know, so it's... it's it's in your right to know if that is happening. You know, there are like our agreements that you have to read there. I mean, no one does. I'm watching over you more and more and stuff, and where does it stop? And it's just the beginning, so it's a little bit worrying. But if the boss is watching in Ontario, workers will now know. A new law says employers have 30 days to tell employees if they're being monitored on computers and smartphones, which legally companies are allowed to do. Once we know what they are actually doing, then we'll have a better sense of what whether those monitoring systems are breaching any other legislation. While Quebec, Alberta and BC all have privacy legislation that sets limits on data collection, Ontario's new rules do not. It's not really penalizing employers for moder monitoring the, the employees, nor is it really preventing them from doing so. With Time Doctor, you can easily track the workday activities of all your employees. With more people working from home during the pandemic, more Canadian companies turn to these tools. Software like this can monitor how often you're typing, who you're video calling. It can even take screenshots of the websites you're on. They want an understanding of what the user is doing when they're working remotely so they can assist them uh, in being more productive. There's debate about whether monitoring employees can be counterproductive. Workers on TikTok joke about how to game the tracking system. Some experts say there's a better way. You measure productivity on the basis of outputs rather than uh, on monitoring and micromanaging them on all the seconds of their life. Still in a work from home world, workers may be faced with a trade off, consenting to more monitoring if it means more flexibility. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. And NASA is celebrating a technological win tonight. Scientists say they have successfully knocked an asteroid off its path. Now this is a watershed moment for planetary defense and a watershed moment for humanity. You might recall last month NASA slammed a spacecraft into what it called a small harmless asteroid. Not only did it alter the rock, rock's orbit, but the agency says it was even more successful than expected. It was the first time NASA attempted something like this in case an asteroid is ever headed towards Earth. Kanye West is suspended from Twitter and Instagram, but is that an effective way to deal with hate speech online? If he's not at home on one of these platforms, he'll find a home on another. What social media bans can and can't do next. A perilous journey for migrants trying to get into the U.S. through this country. There's evidence that people have been through here, including uh, clothes that have been left behind. So we're going we're gonna to go in and take a look. A CBC News investigation goes undercover to expose human smugglers in Canada. And a television icon and so much more. Well, one of you adolescents, please tell me what's happened. The remarkable life of Angela Lansbury. We're back in two. 
The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. That looks a little terrifying. Three boaters lucky to be alive after more than 24 hours in the water off the coast of Louisiana. Hours they spent fighting off sharks while clinging to debris from their sunken vessel. The U.S. Coast Guard pulled them out of the water, apparently just in time. They had multiple lacerations on their hand, um, almost down to the bone. The men suffering from shark bites and hypothermia. One of their life jackets actually torn apart by a shark. Rapper Kanye West remains locked out of his Twitter and Instagram accounts tonight after he posted anti-Semitic messages. Lisa Shing takes a closer look at just how effective a suspension like that really is. I know I got a bad reputation. In recent years, Kanye West has earned a reputation less for his music and more for stirring controversy. The rapper, now legally known as Ye, has had his Instagram and Twitter accounts locked after making anti-Semitic posts. I actually don't think it's an effective tool in terms of teaching people how to use their words and use their platforms. Despite the suspension, his Twitter account is still active. He just can't post until it's lifted, which could be anywhere from 12 hours to a week. They're not altruistic organizations, despite what they like to say in press releases. They are businesses that are driven off of clicks and eyeballs and ad revenue. Twitter's guidelines say an account is locked when an otherwise healthy account is in the middle of an abusive episode. Kanye West has a history of erratic behavior. In 2016, he was hospitalized and diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Since then, he's used social media to harass his former partner, Kim Kardashian, you may not feel sure direct racial slurs at comedian Trevor Noah, and earlier this month, wore a White Lives Matter t-shirt at Paris Fashion Week. So if he's not at home on one of these platforms, he'll find a home on another. What you doing in the club on a Thursday? While some say he should be permanently banned, finding a home somewhere else could be dangerous. The people that go to the new platform and expend the effort, um, they're usually the hardcore believers. And so they can kind of reinforce some of their idea that they're being persecuted or whatever. Whatever the solution, it isn't easy. It's complicated by advocates who think free speech should include hate speech, like Elon Musk, who has publicly supported Kanye and is making a bid to buy Twitter, saying he'll relax restrictions if he takes over. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. Now to a major development in a high-profile U.S. murder case that got worldwide attention through the hit podcast, Serial. It is my responsibility to acknowledge and to apologize to the family of Heyman Lee and Adnan Saeed. Baltimore State Attorney announced today that all charges against Adnan Saeed have been dropped. This after new DNA testing cleared him as a suspect. Saeed spent 23 years behind bars after being sentenced to life in prison for the 1999 killing of his ex-girlfriend Heyman Lee. In 2014, the podcast raised some doubts about his guilt. Authorities say the investigation into who killed Lee is ongoing. Migrants looking to get into the U.S. are increasingly using this country, Canada, as a passageway. And some are falling prey to those looking to cash in. Jesus doesn't know I'm an undercover journalist. But I know he's a gatekeeper for a smuggling network up next, a CBC News investigation into the world of human smuggling in Canada. Plus, Russia's nuclear threat. How worried should we really be? Tonight, we take you inside a human smuggling operation that uses Canada as a roundabout way to get Mexican migrants into the U.S., a CBC News investigation has found that illegal crossings through a specific section of the Canada-U.S. border have skyrocketed this year. Jorge Barrera went undercover to find out how smuggling networks in cities like Toronto are cashing in. That's it. The meeting is set in a Toronto park. Me llamo Jesus. Jesus. Jorge. Jorge. Jesus doesn't know I'm an undercover journalist. But I know he's a gatekeeper for a smuggling network moving people to America through Canada for a price. 
salimos de aquí, uh -huh. 3,300, uh -huh. y estando ya en el carro de Estados Unidos, se pagan 700 dólares. Se dan 500 para apartar el lugar. He moves fast. El viaje es el día viernes, uh -huh. salimos de aquí de Toronto uh -huh. y vamos hacia Montreal. Okay. Yo tengo un guía, un especialista que conoce ya de toda la ruta y es el que... Sí. I give him the deposit. The wheels are in motion. 3,000 kilometers to the south, danger and death tolls rising along the Mexico-U.S. border. Amidst that chaos, whispers of another safer route to the north, feeding smuggling networks in cities like Toronto. But for many, these promises of an easier path to the American dream through Canada aren't what they seem. Okay, straight north of here is the Canada-US border. And uh, local residents have actually pointed us to a path that's been recently used. And uh, they told us that uh, there's evidence that people have been through here, including uh, clothes that have been left behind. So we're gonna, we're gonna go in and take a look. Definitely someone has you know, walked through here. It's rough going you know, through here, especially at night. Nos, nos los pintaban bonito. Y ya ahí, pues, como dije, no es tanto problema, voy a intentar irme. 21-year-old Yazuri Martinez Alvarez needed to believe. Tengo una niña de un año. Pues lamentablemente allá en México no, no se encuentra trabajo. Menos ahorita. Hay mucho feminicida, hay mucho peligro para las mujeres. Y un salario tan mínimo que nos dan. No. Yazuri was put in contact with a smuggler in Toronto. Nos dijeron que solamente era tres horas caminando, que teníamos que pasar por un maizal y por ciudad, que no había tanto peligro. She didn't need a visa as a Mexican national, so she flew to the city in late May and spent her life savings to pay the smuggler's price. Estaban cobrando seis mil dólares. Éramos tres hombres y yo, y nos llevaron hasta Montreal. The car drove south, under the cover of night, stopping just a kilometer from the line. Y cuando ya llegamos, nos dijeron que nos teníamos que bajar corriendo, entonces nosotros nos bajamos corriendo hasta que llegamos a un bosque. Y en el bosque nos perdimos, no encontrábamos este, la salida. Finally, the group emerged on U.S. soil. Cuando salimos vimos que venía una camioneta, que nos dijeron que era una camioneta la que nos iba a recoger y nosotros salimos y corrimos a, a montarnos en ella. The getaway vehicle had been waiting there for them, but as soon as it pulled away, pues nos agarró la migra. Yazuri Martinez Alvarez and her group were spotted uh, by sensors and cameras. Um, just up from here. Border Patrol agents noticed that there was a white pickup truck driving on Highway 11 right here. That's when Border Patrol pulled them over and they found Yazuri and the others. The uh, Texas Police vehicle is going eastbound back on 11 now. Patrol agent Chris Buskey and his team guard the section of the border the group crossed, a 48 kilometer stretch along the New York State Quebec line. Toronto and Montreal make this area very accessible. Plus you look at the network of highways and interstates right here. So it's accessibility, it's the ease of crossing that uh, it makes this area much more attractive. Buskey's team patrols just a part of this wider section of the Canada-US line known to US agents as the Swanton Sector. It's seeing a sharp spike in illegal crossings, at least 600 caught since March. The tide's getting higher. It is absolutely getting higher. It seems to be since about March or April of this year. And it, stayed, it has stayed consistent since then. Hey, did, uh, did we come up with some? Copy, there's nine in this vehicle. Hey, they caught him. Another group caught by the patrol, but their prime concern are those in the shadows pulling the strings of smuggling networks. Those are the criminals that we are trying to apprehend, and those are the criminals that are endangering the community. And that is our job 
to stop these guides because they're exploiting these illegal migrants, those are the people we're here to stop. People like Jose de Sala Garcia, the man who picked up Yazuri and her group after they crossed the line, charged with alien smuggling and later released. Yazuri said she feared him more than the police. CBC News has learned the Sala Garcia is a top lieutenant for an alleged major drug trafficker in New York City named Nelson Cruz. Detectives believe Cruz led an organization that imported fentanyl from Mexico and sold weapons on the side. Both men are now in custody on drug and gun charges. Que si a mí no me hubieran agarrado ahora sí que los policías no sé dónde estuviera. A flood of emotion when Yazuri is finally released in late July. Hola, mami. But her journey is far from over. She's now a file in the U.S. immigration system. Hola. Her immigration lawyer, Halinka Zolchik. <laughs> Mexico has been getting more and more dangerous, more and more corrupt. When it's bad there, then that's when people come. It's the smugglers that don't really care about, you know, these lives. And the promises that the smugglers make, the coyotes make, is very different from the reality. In Ottawa, the federal minister in charge of border security, Marco Mendicino, says smugglers need to be targeted on multiple fronts. That means continuing to uh, support police with the resources that they need, continuing to ensure that we have all the legislative tools in place that are necessary, and finally, making sure that we have strong lines of communication with the United States so that we can share intelligence, share information, and bust up those networks. <laughs> Jesus sets the time and location for the pickup. Okay. I'm there when he arrives at the Toronto Transit Station. A second traveler gets in the SUV on a journey likely doomed to end in the hands of U.S. immigration. That weekend, Border Patrol catch at least 19 people after they cross the same area that Jesus promised would be safe. I call Jesus later and reveal I am a journalist. Trabajo por la emisora CBC. He tells me it was his first time setting up a pickup and that he's only one link in the chain. I asked him if he thinks it's fair to charge people thousands of dollars just to end up behind bars. ¿Tú crees que eso es justo para cobrar a alguien 4.500 jugadores para que lleguen a una cárcel? En... No, claro que no, no es justo para nadie. Nada tenía conocimiento de eso. Pero no It's true. It's not fair. Jorge, the woman in your story, Yuzuri, expressed a lot of emotion about that journey through Canada into the U.S. You spoke with others who had similar stories, right? Yes, Adrian, we spoke with four other women, and just like Yazuri, they were apprehended by U.S. Border Patrol. They told us how they paid thousands of dollars on promises of safe and easy journeys that turned brutal. They were left at the mercy of these human smugglers, and, and you heard their lawyers speak about this, how these smugglers do not have their well-being in mind when they leave them abandoned on the line. And some of these women told us they wanted to speak out to warn others who may be thinking about following similar trails, Adrian. And, and where, Jorge, do Canadian authorities fit into this? Well, these smuggling networks operate in cities like Toronto and Montreal, and they have cross-border connections that deal in things like drugs, fentanyl, for example, and weapons. Now, this may give some political leaders some pause, along with the possibility that others may also put their lives in the hands of these networks, unless word gets around about who these smugglers are and that the path they lay out often leads into the hands of U.S. Border Patrol. Adrian? All right, Jorge Barrera, thanks to you and your team for that work.
As Russian missiles rain down on Ukraine, there are some thinking about an even bigger threat from Vladimir Putin. Up next, how worried should we be about a nuclear strike? And later, a legend of the screen and stage, remembering Angela Lansbury. Earlier in our coverage, you heard that curiously, there's a danger to Ukraine's success on the battlefield. It is prompting Vladimir Putin to escalate the war. His attempted annexations, partial mobilization, and reckless nuclear rhetoric represents the most significant escalation since the start of the war. With that repeated rhetoric from Putin, world leaders now openly worry about where this escalation is leading, whether this war really could go nuclear. And joining us now to talk about Russia's nuclear threat is John Wolfstall, who was a special advisor to then Vice President Joe Biden on nuclear security and non-proliferation, now works to eliminate nuclear weapons. John, when people talk about Russia maybe using nuclear weapons, my mind as a layperson immediately goes to, you know, global thermonuclear war, end of day scenario. But, but what are the real scenarios? And I can see, you know, maybe that is one of them. I think we do have to be worried about a wide range of possible scenarios. Russia has over 5,000 nuclear weapons at its disposal. Vladimir Putin can use them basically at will. Um, some are battlefield weapons that are launched through artillery uh, tubes, and some are long-range missiles uh, that can reach 10,000 kilometers or more. And we worry about a wide range of scenarios, but most of them involve either use on the battlefield to attack Ukrainian troops or to attack Ukrainian cities. Um, that could devastate local populations in the state of Ukraine. And, and what would push Putin to that option, do you think? Well, so this is where it's really hard to understand exactly what's going on in the mind of your adversary. Um, the belief is that Russia would only use nuclear weapons if the existence of the Russian state were threatened. And I think most people appreciate that in Vladimir Putin's mind, he may think of his own existence as being one and the same as the existence of the Russian state. So if he feels threatened personally, or if he feels that the Russian state is about to collapse, then he might resort to the use of nuclear weapons. But the challenge, of course, is neither Vladimir Putin or anyone in Ukraine or even the president of the United States has perfect knowledge of all of the different things going on in the battlefield or strategically. And there's always the risk of a miscalculation or an accident. Assessing these calculations has been has been your job, and I'm wondering, we've seen a lot of changes in Ukraine over the last few days. Is there any one of those changes in particular that, that alarms you the most in terms of what it, it may lead him to do? It's hard to speculate how Putin views the overall um, war going. Um, he seems relatively safe and secure in Moscow. We, If, if anything, I've been um, struck by the certain things we haven't seen. Uh, neither Zelensky nor President Biden has escalated to the point of attacking uh, Russian territory proper. We haven't seen bombings in Moscow. We haven't seen an attempt to re um, exact retribution for the indiscriminate missile attack. So I think, in fact, the West and Ukraine have been relatively restrained. But of course, attacks in Crimea, uh, failures on the battlefield could lead Putin to reevaluate whether or not he's winning or losing and could lead him to escalate in a number of ways. So you talk about Joe Biden. You know, you used to work, obviously, uh, for then Vice President Joe Biden. These are the sorts of conversations, I, I presume, that you were having with him. What would you be advising him to watch for or perhaps to do or say right now? So uh, having worked for uh, then Vice President, um, he has been involved in nuclear issues for well over 40 years. And so he's very keenly aware of the risks here. Uh, I think the real challenge is, as you've heard the president say, is we keep trying to provide Putin with off ramps, ways for him to de-escalate, ways for him to pull back from the brink. And time and time again, we see him pushing forward. I worry about that scenario being compounded by some other battlefield or third party actor who gets involved and leads things to escalate in a way that maybe neither Putin nor President Biden want or can anticipate. Okay, well, now that you're worried, I'm worried too. So thanks for that. John Wolfstall, thank you, you know, very much for joining us. Sure, my pleasure. Angela Lansbury is being remembered tonight for her long career in theater and TV and movies. <laughs> Coming up next, saying goodbye to an iconic performer. Plus, 
An Ontario record store owner finds a one-of-a-kind live recording from a one-of-a-kind artist. We'll tell you who it is in our moment. I only drink Rothschild 61. If you don't have it, Mr. Brown, get it. There she is, Angela Lansbury, star of the television series Murder, She Wrote, has died at the age of 96. The three-time Oscar nominee is being remembered for much more than just her TV work. Lansbury was acclaimed for her roles both on stage and on screen. Thomas Degla takes a look at her career and her little-known connection to Canada. With a career spanning eight decades, Angela Lansbury's early work came in black and white. Life is war. Don't count the casualties. She was born in London in 1925, and it was in a downtown Montreal nightclub that Lansbury made her stage debut, having to conceal that she was just 16. Nobody ever asked me what age I was. It was a wonder that I even got across the border, truthfully. You don't know what you've missed, sir. Her rookie performance on screen in Gaslight in 1944 <laughs> earned the first of three Academy Award nominations. She was careful not to be typecast. I was a young character actress. And the, these days, that word is a dirty word in our business, character actress. Though she was often given the role of mother. Why don't you pass the time by playing a little solitaire? Like in 1962, cast in The Manchurian Candidate as Lawrence Harvey's mom, though she was only three years older than him. Lansbury wowed Broadway in Mame in 1966, winning her first Tony Award. Another four trophies would follow. She was an extraordinary presence on, on stage. Uh, you know, she knew how to draw your eye to her. It was 80s TV that made her a household name, with the role of writer and sleuth Jessica Fletcher in Murder, She Wrote. True as it can be. Her voice became familiar to a new generation in the 90s, playing Mrs. Potts in Disney's Beauty and the Beast. While on stage, she kept performing into her 90s. I'll probably pass away, you know, with one hand, <laughs> one hand on my script. At age 96, Lansbury died at her Los Angeles home, her life dedicated to her craft until the end. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Amazing woman. Now have a look at these. These cassette tapes look like any other old mixtape. Remember those? That's what one record store owner thought until he looked a little bit closer and pressed play. So those bootleg tapes contain a live recording of a 1973 Neil Young concert that has never been heard by anyone who wasn't in the crowd that night. That is until right now. This rare find is tonight's moment. This very kind woman came in with a box of assorted cassette tapes. At the bottom of this box, there was a recording, two tapes, and it said, Neil Young, live at McMaster University, uh, 1973. I looked it up online. The show happened. People were there, but there was no known recording anywhere. The woman who donated it, her and her husband were the actual people who recorded the concert. They snuck in a tape recorder, and they recorded the entire show. From the moment he walks out, to the moment he walks off. The quality for a bootleg is phenomenal. I made a TikTok about it, because I was like, guys, how cool is this? It's a lost Neil Young tape. I had no intent of selling it. But that didn't stop people from making me offers. I've got lucrative offers. I turned down every single one, but Neil Young is very interested in repossessing this tape. So I'm very proud to announce that we are going to be donating the tapes to the Neil Young archives, and hopefully everybody can hear this tape down the road. And that is the right thing to do. So uh, it was Cheech and Chong who opened for Neil Young uh, back in 1973. Tickets were five bucks, and as soon as word got out that those tapes existed, everybody flooded the store to share their photos of it. That is a national for October the 11th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.